Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Mrs. Frank McCarthy. That's how she's listed. Number 239, A Vision. I lost all hope of inheriting my uncle's estate at Martinique when, through some mysterious freak, he left it in his will to an utter stranger, Paul Wade by name, who had lived with my uncle since the death of my cousin Athely in New York. This stranger seemed to be beloved as a son by my uncle, and it was probable that this beautiful inheritance would be forever estranged from the name and the family of Gervais. It was therefore a delightful surprise to me to receive a letter from Mr. Wade, inviting me to visit him at Martinique, stating that his health was failing, and he would be glad if, as his rightful heir, I would remain with him and take charge of the estate. I lost no time in hastening to him, and finding him, though very reticent and preoccupied in his manner, a most excellent fellow at heart, was careful not to pester him with intrusive questions. We got on very well together, and he was even good enough to tell me that he entertained a sincere regard for me, for which I was, in good truth, very grateful. This happened one night in the library at Martinique. We had been sitting there silently together. About us there was every luxury conceivable. The grounds outside were in themselves an earthly paradise. But somehow I had fallen into a singular reverie. I looked for a while at the ghostly shadows of the trees upon the garden walk outside. They seemed in the weird moonlight to be dancing in elfish measure to the melancholy cadence of the waves breaking upon the distant shore. The silence became oppressive. "'Perhaps you'll laugh at me, Paul,' I said, "'but in a sentimental way I believe in ghosts. Not the fellows that stalk about in white sheets, you know, but the communion of a heavenly spirit with an earthly one.' He startled and looked at me earnestly. Then he stretched out his hand to me across the library table. "'I like you very much, Antoine,' he said, "'and I have great reason to be thankful you are to inherit the estate. I spoke to its owner through just such a communion as you spoke of, through the agency of a spirit.' I dropped his hand and poured out for myself some more wine. "'Come with me,' he cried, snatching up a candle, and following him through the spacious corridor, I entered the bedchamber of my host.' It fronted the sea, and, though plainly furnished, was perhaps the most attractive room in the house. Immediately over the mantel was a large picture covered with some fleecy drapery, through which I could see the faint outlines of a dead woman lying upon a velvet pall. Without raising the curtain that concealed the picture, he thrust his hand under it, and grasping some letters that were put into the frame, hurried me out of the room again and back to our table in the library. I need these, he said, seating himself and placing the letters before him, to complete the history of the picture you saw just now. I beg your pardon, I said. You forgot to allow me to see it. I must confess, I added, yielding to a reasonable curiosity. I should like to very much. It is of no interest to anyone but me, he rejoined quickly, as you will see when you hear the following story. I entered the city of New York, Mr. Wade continued, one cold night in December, under the black, cold, infinite sky that night, there was not a creature more absolutely friendless than I. Between me and starvation there rested a very little money, a crude idea of color, some talent in drawing, and a resolute will to become a painter. I was in search of a studio in the great metropolis. All that I needed was a garret with an upper light, and this I stumbled upon in an old house in West Broadway. It was difficult to induce the miserable old Frenchman that kept the store below to let me have the room. He wanted to thrust me into every nook in the old barrack but the garret, the very one that was necessary to me. The man was old, with little piercing gray eyes, skin like a piece of parchment, and a nose and chin that almost met. Greed of the most rapacious and repelling kind was written upon every line of his face. I offered him a month's rent in advance for his garret, and the sight of the money finished the bargain. He signed the receipt with his shaky skeleton claws. His name was Baptiste Perret. Having procured possession of my room, I proceeded to explore it. A matter of five minutes finished the research. It was large and square, and gloomy to desolation. A dim light struggled in the upper window through the dirt and grime of ages. The dingy boards were full of cracks and holes. The old black rafters concealed an army of spiders, and the immense festoons of webs were so ingeniously contrived as to call forth a species of admiration. An old wooden bedstead leaned up against the wall in one corner. In another reclined a chair minus a back. 
This comprised the furniture in the room. An open fireplace yawned before me, suggestive of the genial warmth that poverty denied me. I looked about me dejectedly. What a horrible future loomed up before me. To pass day after day in this dingy den, perhaps in the end to die here of starvation. I, who loved light and warmth and luxury, to be condemned to the desolation of this abominable garret. I started up and fled from the house. I went out in the cold December night and walked restlessly up and down, arguing with myself manfully. At the end of an hour I went back to my garret with a few candles and some crackers. I resolved firmly that, come what might, that garret for the time should be my home. It was after ten when I lay down upon the bed in the corner and strove to sleep. I found it impossible. It was too cold. There was but one blanket, and that was of the thinnest and most miserable quality. A fierce wind rattled at the windows and swept through the room. My very bones ached, and shaking as if with an ague, I strove in vain to chafe a little warmth into my limbs. I lay thus awake for a couple of hours. Suddenly I felt a singular numb sensation creeping over me. A delicious warmth spread itself about me, crept into my lungs, and lifted the oppression from my chest. I felt as if transported from that terrible region of Dante's Inferno, where the lost are embedded in eternal fields of ice, to the realms of paradise. The thought struck me that I had gone through with the preliminary torture of freezing, and had reached the fatal stage of numbness, which had been described to me as a blissful reaction. I resolved not to struggle against it in the least. If death had come to me in this shape, it was too comfortable to resist. I became, however, gradually conscious of a feeling that startled me. I was certain there was something or somebody in that room with me. This fancy was a troublesome one, for to prove the truth of my conviction, I was compelled to get out of bed and search the room. I aroused myself from my trance reluctantly and strove to reach the mantel, where I had left my candle and matches. As I groped along the floor, my hand suddenly came in contact with something like drapery. I started back wondering, and recalled to myself the utter bareness of the room when I went to bed. Then I again stretched forth my hand. I distinctly felt a hard substance, a square beam of wood with folds of cloth hanging about it. Resolving to see this strange article of furniture, I got upon my feet and walked directly to the wall, feeling my way around the room until I reached the mantel. Lighting my candle, I looked eagerly about me. Not a trace of anything could be seen. The room was as bare and desolate as ever, more bare and desolate, for it was colder than before. I went back to bed again, and shivered there till morning. The next day I passed in a futile effort to paint. I arranged my easel, stretched my canvas, laid out my colors, and endeavored to sketch out the outlines of a picture. The effort was a wretched one, and I went out for a walk. Passing my landlord on the rickety stairs, it occurred to me to ask of him the meaning of the singular piece of furniture I had found in my room the night before. "'Tell me, Mr. Perret,' I said, "'do you keep a ghost up in my garret?' He started back, an ashy pallor on his face. "'Don't get frightened,' I hastened to add. "'It's only the ghost of a table or couch, or something in the furniture line. I can swear I felt two posts of wood in the middle of the floor, with some sort of drapery about them.' Mr. Perret did not reply, and I went through the store out into the street. It appeared to me that my landlord did not do a very thriving business, as the most abject poverty and wretchedness seemed to reign in that great barren room. It was something in the pawnbroker way, as there were bundles and boxes with tickets upon them, but the look of mold and desolation was upon everything. Getting back about nightfall, I lighted my candle, with a bustling attempt at cheer that was pitiably abortive. The fact was... I was never made to rough it in solitude of this miserable kind. Then it was impossible to fight against the cold that reigned in my garret. It made the teeth chatter in my head, the blood congeal in my veins, and I looked back with longing to the feeling of relief I had felt upon the previous night. I was glad when the time came for me to sleep under my wretched blanket. My delight may be imagined when, after suffering an agony of cold, I felt suddenly again the delicious warmth of the night before, the soft air, the impalpable, vague luxury of my former trance. I remained perfectly quiet, resolving this time not to move. But against my will, although I resolutely strove against it, I became conscious that the something of the other night before 
was in the room with me again, and although I would much rather not have investigated the mystery, I was in a manner compelled to again get out of bed and grope about the floor. Suddenly my hand touched the drapery of cloth, and in withdrawing it I felt again the beam of wood. I confess I was startled. I resolved to grasp it, whatever it was, and drag it with me into the light. But upon endeavoring to move it, I found it was impossible. Either it was too heavy, or it was fastened to the floor. I passed my hand along the folds of cloth, and found that they extended for several feet. The beams of wood seemed to support a few boards at the top, over which this cloth was thrown. I got upon my feet, and placed my hand upon the top of the boards. I drew back suddenly. An icy chill struck to the very marrow of my bones. I retreated to the wall again, and, reaching the mantel, lighted my candle and looked about me. Nothing, absolutely nothing, was to be seen. I remained in the chair all night. The next night I left my candle burning, and saw nothing but the bare room, felt nothing but the cold. I suffered so much with cold, disappointment, and baffled curiosity, that when night came again I resolved to put away my candle. If darkness was necessary for the investigation of this mystery, there should be the most stiggy in obscurity. Nevertheless, when, upon shivering for a time, I felt suddenly the familiar warmth envelop me, the luxurious atmosphere creep in at my mouth and nostrils, I trembled. I confess it, I was seized with a nameless terror. Chill after chill crept down my back. A peculiar sensation went through my scalp. I felt, so to say, my hair rising upon my head. This physical cowardice did not, however, deter me from pursuing my task, nor did it detract from my eagerness and anxiety to solve the whole mystery of that presence in the room. I got out of my bed and crept softly over the floor. Some intuitive instinct impelled me to use no haste, make no noise. Gentleness and courtesy, reverence and chivalry, were needed here, not coarseness, nor rude strength, nor brutality. I reached the drapery and extended my hand along the substance which it covered. Suddenly the drapery stopped. My hand fell an inch or two and touched a face colder than marble. It was a dead body which that drapery covered, and which lay upon those boards in my room. I had known it the night before. I had looked forward to it confidently, but could not subdue the ague that seized upon my limbs. An icy sweat covered me. I was once again overcome with fear, and retreated to the mantel. When I lighted the candle, I was, of course, alone, and cursed my cowardice bitterly. A week after I had become familiar with the presence, and had grown, horrible as it may seem, to look forward to its coming. Why not? Desolate, abandoned, despairing as I was, it saved me from madness. It brought me warmth and dreamful ease. It was food for my mind, consolation to my heart. If the living had cast me off, the dead had come to comfort me. I passed hour after hour alone with it, and grew familiar with it as with a companion. It was the body of a young girl. The outlines of the face were smoothly rounded, the features delicate and small, the lids of the eyes were large and full, and the lashes fine and long. The teeth were regular and perfect, and even the tiny ear was a marvel of exquisite form. The hair I felt must be of a soft golden color. It had not the vigor of black or brown, and passed through my hand like meshes of silk or floss. I could not see it. I could see nothing. But instinct, fancy, who can tell what it was, taught me every line of the form, every color, every grace of my knightly companion. Ah, how gracious and good was that poor dead girl to me! Thus early deprived of life and the gladness of being, she wandered back and brought her sweet spirit to minister to mine. Some divine womanly pity led her to seek out the most wretched creature upon earth to shed light and joy upon his path. At last a divine inspiration seized upon me. Since all her loveliness was mine, why not copy it? I resolved to paint her, to have her for my own forever. Then, behold a happy man at last. My dingy garret was transformed into a palace of light. Day after day I lingered at my work, forgetting to eat or drink in my gladness. Day after day the picture grew, until at last I saw her. A sweet pale face the soft low brow shadowed by a cloud of golden hair, a delicate sensitive mouth and rounded chin, 
the glory of her eyes hidden by the transparent lids. A face and form beautiful as a woman's and holy as an angel's abided upon my easel. The day upon which I finished it, I was wild with delight. I waited for the night with feverish eagerness, for I wanted to tell my pale, cold girl all that I had done for her. But alas, when night came I sought her, and she was not. My hand wandered in vain for the familiar drapery. It had vanished with its sweet burden forever. I sought my candle and lighted it with trembling fingers. If she had gone from my picture, I must have died with sorrow, but she was there to gladden my eyes and comfort my heart. What if it was the picture of a dead woman with her pall about her? To me she might have been lying asleep upon a couch of velvet in an atmosphere of luxury and perfume. I had painted her as she came to me, all cold and pale, but filling me with warmth and gladness. But I was starving, literally starving. I had not a penny left with which to buy food, and my greedy old landlord was clamoring for his rent. He forced his way into my room one morning and cast his sacrilegious eyes upon my picture. He was cowardly enough to be afraid of it and put out his hands in an agony of terror. "'Why, you miserable man,' I said, "'are you afraid of a picture?' He staggered out upon the landing. "'Trust me for a little while, Mr. Perret," I said, "'and I will pay.' He wrung his hands and declared that he wanted no money, but begged of me, for the love of God, to go and leave him in peace. He called heaven to witness he was poor, miserably poor. "'All that you see below is not mine,' he cried piteously. "'They are my customers, on the faith of a man.' Then let me also be a customer, I said, taking from my pocket a silver watch. What will you give me for this? To my surprise, he wrung his hands together and held them up to me pleadingly. What do you want for it? he whined. I am so miserably poor. It is worth nothing. What do you want for it? It's worth ten dollars, I said, and followed him down into the store. He seemed in a terror of excitement, and after giving me the ten dollars, appeared to hesitate about taking the watch. I left him watching me as I went down the street to get my frugal provisions for the week. When I returned, a grim silence prevailed in the house, but I was much too preoccupied to notice it. I had resolved to place my picture in the academy. If you should ask me why, I could not tell, but something determined me to ask for its admittance, and it was received. They even praised it and ticketed it with a number. What name, they asked. "'Ah, I do not know,' I replied. "'The obliging gentleman looked at it for a while, "'then at me, wonderingly. "'Suppose we call it a vision,' said one of them. "'But does not a vision imply something seen?' I asked. "'Well, won't they see your painting?' he replied. "'At all events, it's a nice fanciful name, "'and I'm a judge of these things.' "'He seemed, in a grandiloquent sort of way, "'good-natured enough, and I thanked him for his suggestion.' Presently I stood before my picture and found it was called Number 289, A Vision. Beside it was a dreamy landscape, a bit of island scenery, all soft and glowing and beautiful, as befitted some region of the sun. I know not how it was, but I fancied my poor child enjoyed the nearness of that dream of an enchanted island. I left her there and went back to my old home. The store upon the ground floor was closed, the shutters were up, and as I passed the door of the back room, I saw that it was empty. I went through into the store, but that also was empty. All the bundles and tickets were gone, but upon the counter lay my silver watch. I looked upon it in bewilderment. What did it all mean? If the old Frenchman had fled with the goods of his customers, why not take mine also? He had paid me its nominal value. What could be the meaning of this spasmodic honesty? What fearful mystery enveloped everything in this dreary old house? Why did he shrink from me with terror, and why was he wild with fear at the sight of the picture? I went up to my garret and found the desolation there insupportable. Since the sweet phantom refused to come to me again, since all that remained to me of her rested in that great, warm, luxurious gallery, since that wretched man had fled, why should I cling to this old habitation? I felt that excitement and semi-starvation had already done enough for my brain and determined to shake this dust and fantasy from me. I would go out in the clear, cold sunshine and labor and hope and live like the human creatures about me. That day I left the house in West Broadway and took a cheap lodging uptown, for, shall I confess it, 
I was unable to get work in earnest until I had again with me all that I could have had of my friend. Let me once have her picture, the very coinage of my love for her, as my daily companion, and I felt that I could do anything. I haunted the academy night and day, waiting anxiously for the time when I could carry away my prize. I parted with a valuable ring and lived frugally again, in poverty, loneliness, almost in despair, for at times a bitter agony assailed me. How insatiable is man! I began to regret that she was dead. I felt a vague yearning when I thought of that sweet, cold face, the still hands. Bitter sobs rose in my throat. I felt my heart bursting within me. She was the only woman I had ever loved, and I did not even know her name. She could not tell me, for she was dead. Without doubt, she was dead. I knew I was losing flesh and spirits day by day. I knew that in the old village where I was born, no one would recognize the gaunt, shabby, wild-eyed man for the joyous, hopeful youth that only a few years ago seemed filled with the ruddiness of life. I felt at times a desperate longing to rid myself of my reveries and dreams. The strife for gold seemed to me a manly thing then, full of vigor and common sense and courage. I envied the waiter at the cheap eating house, the man that carried in coal, and going down upon the dock one day, I joined the body of men who trundled barrows to and fro a great ship that lay nearby, and shouted and strained my muscles with the rest. All in vain, my physical power was too weak, the tension upon my nerves too strong. All I gained by my day's labor were blistered hands, aching joints, a singular dizziness in my head, and a dollar and fifty cents. When I entered my room that night, I found this note upon my table. Mr. Paul Wade, Dear Sir, I have learned that your picture in the Academy, number 289, A Vision, is in the possession of the artist. I desire to purchase it. An early reply will much oblige. Yours very truly, Antoine Gervais, Blank Hotel. The idea of parting with my picture for gold was ludicrous enough to make me laugh, if I had not forgotten how. I immediately sent this reply. Mr. Antoine Gervais, Dear Sir, The picture, number 289 of Vision, is not for sale. Yours truly, Paul Wade. Within an hour, I received the following reply. Mr. Paul Wade, Dear Sir, Will you do me the kindness to grant me an early interview at my hotel? I would not ask this favor if my health permitted me the pleasure of calling upon you. As it is of the greatest importance to me to see you, I will take the liberty of asking you to come at the hour of four this evening, and shall await your coming with anxiety. Yours very sincerely, Antoine Gervais. A lingering respect for the rules of civilization compelled me to comply with this last request, and punctually at four I went to the hotel. I asked for Mr. Gervais, and was shown into a private parlor. Almost immediately there entered, from an adjoining room, a tall, thin gentleman with an air of subdued grief that relieved the otherwise haughty and severe expression of his face. There was something familiar to me in his large brown eyes. He wore a velvet dressing robe, trimmed with fur, for which he apologized, stating that his health was delicate and that he came from a warm climate. I am from the island of Martinique, he said, and I hope soon to return and, with your permission, take with me your picture. That cannot be, I replied. I will not part with it. Oh, pardon me, he exclaimed with emotion. I must have it. I could not leave it in the possession of another. I cannot part with it, I repeated. Will you pardon me, he said, and not deem me impertinent if I ask why? Because it is dear to me, I replied frankly. It is, I may say, necessary to me. As, as a thing of art, he asked. Yes, I answered, and as a thing of affection. He started and looked at me earnestly. Will you do me the favor, the very great favor, to explain what you mean, he said. No, I replied, for the simple reason that you would not understand me and would consider me a madman. Ah, sir, he said, if I could induce you to give me your confidence, tell me, is, is the picture a portrait? No, yes, I said, scarcely knowing how to reply. It is, and yet it is not. I assure you, sir, I added impatiently, the original of that picture can be nothing to anyone but me. To me she is everything. Ah, great heaven, he said, grasping a cane and leaning heavily upon it. You say she. Tell me, then, who is she? What is her name? Where did you first find her? And where is she now? 
Let me look upon her in the name of God. That would be impossible, I said. I cannot. You cannot, he said, rising from his seat and approaching me. Are you, then, determined that my life shall be this sacrifice to your obstinacy and cruelty? Since I have seen your picture, I have neither tasted food nor slept, and you will not in pity answer these few simple questions. Sir, I replied, also rising from my seat and confronting him, I will do that which you desire of me, but I warn you it will only lead you to consider me a madman. I do not know who is the original of my picture. I do not know her name or her country. I found her first in the dead of night, in a dark, bare, gloomy garret, lying upon a few boards in the middle of the room, and covered with a heavy drapery of some kind. It seemed like cloth, but I cannot describe it accurately, for I could not see it. I could only feel. She lay quite still and motionless, for she was dead. The old gentleman trembled and fell back into his chair. He looked at me with horror that seemed tempered with pity. Did I not tell you, I said, interpreting the expression of his face, that you would think me a madman? Nay, he replied gently, we are all a little mad. It is not so. You have a good and noble face, and will not, I think, refuse me your picture when I tell you why I desire it. Listen, I beg of you, and you will see that you cannot withhold it from me. My name is Antoine Gervais. I live at the island of Martinique. Twenty years ago, heaven, in giving me a daughter, took from me a beloved wife. This little one was the only tie that bound me to life. We lived together in our beautiful home, as the blessed are said to live in paradise. But we may not be too happy here, lest we find life too sweet to resign it. My daughter fell into delicate health, and the air of our island was not found beneficial for her in summer. We determined to spend the hot months at the north. Four years ago we embarked for New York. The village was unusually long and tedious, and upon our arrival I was afraid to take my poor athlete to a public hotel. A fellow passenger directed me to a quiet place near the landing. It was kept by a Frenchman, and although his appearance was calculated to inspire distrust, he was afterward of great service to me. Although the place was a poor one, I was enabled, with plenty of money, to give my daughter every luxury and care that her health demanded. All in vain, she drew worse and died. Mr. Gervais was silent for a time. Overcome with emotion, he leaned his head upon his cane. I looked upon him with unspeakable yearning. Tell me, I said, were you unable to remain with your daughter during her illness? Was she under your immediate care? I never left her for a moment, said Mr. Gervais, until, until she left me. Then I became for a time utterly helpless, and was confined to my bed, while they prepared my child for her last sad journey, for I took her home with me to Martinique. Her last words, her dying prayer, was to sleep there under her own sunny sky. She rests there now, in a strip of land by the sea that she loved well. But before she was shut away from my sight forever, I was carried to see her, and I swear to you, sir, as she lay there upon her velvet shawl, pure and beautiful as an angel, just so she lies in your picture. The dead girl created by a fantasy of your brain is the exact prototype of my daughter, Athelie. Will you, then, still refuse to me the portrait of my daughter? No, I said, slowly getting upon my feet and leaving the room. You shall have it. Then I stumbled out into the street, staggering along like a drunkard or a madman. Faint with hunger and excitement, I saw suddenly before me a mean little shrunken figure of a man, his parchment-like skin, his loose, thin lips, his long, hooked nose, loomed upon me like a figure in a magic lantern. He moved like an automaton. I have been waiting for you, he said, clutching my arm with his long, bony fingers. If I tell you where you may find her, will you swear not to harm me? That is her father in there. Does he know I took away the body of his daughter? Has he come after me? He knows nothing, Baptiste Perret. But you are the devil, he went on. You put her in a picture. Tell me where I may find her, I demanded. Yes, he said eagerly. What harm did I do? Wasn't it a wicked thing to put away all those jewels? When folks were poor and starving, she was covered with gems, and the shawls were worth fortunes of money. What matters it after one is dead, so long as enough ground covered her? I sent the box and I kept the body, but I buried it afterward decently in a cemetery. 
I'll tell you where, if you promise not to hurt me. A silence fell upon the library at Martinique. The face of Paul looked so cold and pale in the moonlight that I hastily poured out for him a goblet of wine. He put it aside with his hand. You see, he said calmly, she was stolen by this miserable man for the jewels she wore. Stolen, and put away among strangers, while her father took the empty casket to the dear land she loved so well. It was more than she could bear. She came to me for help, and that is all, Antoine. I brought her to her father. He was good enough to call me his son, and beg of me not to leave him. When he died, I placed him by her side, over there, where you hear the sea. There is room there for another, only me, and I have it for certainty that I shall not wait long. That is why I have told you all this, so that you may hold sacred the resting place of the dead. A fortnight later, Paul died, whether by some mysterious agency, or that he put it away quietly, I do not know, but when we found him dead upon his bed, the picture had disappeared from over the mantel and could not be found. I confess I was not sorry. The End